Hello, welcome to the Friday, October 4th, 2019 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Ransomware is the gift that keeps on giving, at least if you are a security analyst. But attackers don't always use new ransomware. They sometimes sort of keep reusing older versions and just come up with a new ruse to get people to infect themselves. Xavier came across such an example. The email advertising the ransomware does follow some of the playbook of fake antivirus. It does claim that the user's system is infected and suggests that they are downloading a repair tool from Microsoft. The email itself follows standard Microsoft branding. When the user downloads this repair tool, they of course download the ransomware and execute it willingly. So no real exploit involved here. Now, the ransomware being installed here is quite old. Xavier was able to actually find the source code for this particular ransomware on GitHub, and it appears to be about two years old. Accordingly, also VirusTotal has pretty good detection for this particular variant. And last week we got a new version of TCP dump and it turns out that it fixes a large number, about 20 different vulnerabilities, some of which are remote code execution vulnerabilities. Of course, TCP dump is sort of one of those tools we always consider old and stable and well secure. Well, they actually have added a lot more application layer protocol intelligence to TCP dump and some of these vulnerabilities at least appear to be related to these new features. So definitely if you are using TCP dump, make sure you are using the latest version 4.9.3. Sadly, there's very little known about these vulnerabilities at this point. I will link to the TCP dump change log, which literally just has the CVE numbers and then in parentheses, the product protocol affected by it. Some of uh, these uh, vulnerabilities were actually not really fixed, but some of uh, the output delivered by TCP dump was just disabled. So essentially they removed some of the vulnerable features. And researchers with Kaspersky found a pretty interesting new piece of malware that they are calling Reductor. The specific feature here of this malware is how it interacts with TLS traffic. Now, first of all, the malware is adding additional certificates to the infected systems and has a feature that allows the attacker to even add additional certificates later. But then it has sort of an interesting trick in how it actually marks the traffic as originating from an infected host. Whenever a host starts a TLS connection, the client, the browser, does provide a client random, which is essentially a random string. Now, this malware actually patches the Firefox and Chrome random number generation feature in order to use, at least as part of this random string, a user ID that identifies the victim. So this is something that's uh, not really seen in other malware and of course uh, quite sophisticated to be able to patch uh, these binaries in this particular way and also probably is not going to be noticed. But well, uh, I guess one way to detect uh, this malware is to check that your client random is actually random and doesn't contain any deterministic parts. And according to Kaspersky, it appears that this uh, TLS client random is then used to identify users that visit uh, various websites via HTTPS and then binaries being downloaded by these users are being replaced on the fly. 
Now the attacker doesn't appear to do any sort of TLS man in the middle as they're doing this, uh, but they're essentially abusing here that a lot of these more shady websites and so that are being targeted here are actually using HTTP then for the actual file download. So while the user first connects to an HTTPS website, the file is downloaded in the clear and easily manipulated after the user is identified via this unique client RAM. Random. Well, it's a Friday again, and I have with me an STI student again today. It's Lucas Saira. Uh, Lucas, uh, could you introduce yourself, please? Thank you very much for this invitation. I really appreciate this opportunity. My name is Lucas Saira, and I am currently enrolled in the Cybersecurity Engineering Core Graduate Certificate course uh, with SANS. So that's great. And you had to write a research paper like most of our students have to do. I believe it was about past the hash attacks in Windows. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your paper, please? I picked this subject after doing the SEC 504 course. I got interested in this specific topic because while uh, following the course, uh, I uh, searched uh, other sources on the internet as well. And I realized very quickly that past the hash in Windows 10 is a subject uh, where there is lots of confusion, lots of contra contradictory information. And some areas don't even seem to be covered at all, in particular past the hash in relation to Microsoft accounts. Therefore, I decided to do a comprehensive testing of uh, this topic using the latest version of Windows, uh, version 1903. And actually, I've achieved quite uh, surprising and interesting results. That's great. Now, I think it's always a problem if uh, people sort of you know, read some old blog post or so that may have been written for Windows 7 and then sort of try to extrapolate how this may work in Windows 10. I think that's where a lot of these this confusion uh, comes from. Now, uh, what were some of the surprises that you uh, found? In terms of findings, there were things one could expect. I focused on testing local, domain, and Microsoft accounts. The domain accounts turned out to be uh, better protected in general, and especially in configurations with uh, Windows Defender Credential Guard, obtaining hashes using the traditional dumping methods, uh, hash dumping methods was not possible at all, whereas it was possible for local and Microsoft accounts. However, when I looked deeper into the problem of dumping the, uh, the hashes of Microsoft accounts, I realized that they behave differently in different situations. When we, for example, dump the hashes from the SAM, they look very similar to the local accounts, and obtaining the hashes was uh, not difficult. When we try to dump the hashes from the memory of the ELSAS process, they, the Microsoft accounts behave more like uh, domain accounts. For example, when Windows Defender Credential Guard is enabled, dumping the hashes is prevented. And now the most interesting finding, and the, the thing that was the most surprising, was related to a very specific scenario. Let's imagine that a computer administrator added a new user, a new Microsoft account user on a specific host. The user has never logged in yet, so the computer had no way of knowing the correct password hash for that user. However, when we try to do the hash dumping, we will see that a certain value was provided. We were able to extract a hash for this account. This hash upon verification turns out to be incorrect. So probably it's some random value that Microsoft populates the field with. But now the most surprising thing is that you can use this value and successfully uh, authenticate using the pass the hash attack. So that's kind of interesting. So that hash, let's call it a hash. It's, it's not a real hash. That's not derived from the password. But if I understand you right, it still works for authentication? Yes, it still works for authentication. I was able to successfully authenticate to a, a Windows Pro host using this hash. 
So do you think this could be used sort of as, you know, like a honey token? I've sometimes seen uh, people sort of use deception methods where they drop specific hashes in memory, for example, or set up accounts with specific hashes uh, to be able to detect uh, that uh, someone is uh, trying to basically pull the past the hash attack. Like these new accounts, they shouldn't really be able to log in with this hash but if they are, uh, then you know someone's playing the ha- past the hash attack. Or do I get this wrong? Or is this one method that you could use? This is an interesting idea. And uh, Honeycreds is one of the methods recommended to detect uh, past the hash attacks. But I would consider this more on the s- surprising side uh, of findings uh, rather than a, a really useful finding. I believe that this might be related to some product defect, which in future versions uh, will be corrected. Yeah, now you mentioned that uh, you know the Microsoft accounts are not that great necessarily. Now, it appears that Microsoft is trying to push, in particular, home small business users more and more towards using Microsoft accounts versus local accounts. Local accounts, of course, aren't that great either. Any preference uh, local accounts versus Microsoft accounts from a security point of view? Based on my testing, I see uh, lots of similarities uh, uh, between those types of accounts from the security point of view. First of all, if the attacker gets uh, privileged access to to a machine, he will be able to uh, obtain hashes of both account types. However, Um, In Windows 10, Microsoft implemented this uh, setting, uh, which is called local account account token filter policy, that by default, uh, whenever you try to execute pass the hash attack uh, remotely, will drop the administrator privileges of the account. So this is significant protection that limits uh, the effectiveness of most of the attacks of this type. But from the security point of view, the major difference between local account accounts and Microsoft accounts I noticed with the credential guard enabled, with, uh, Windows credential guard was also able to protect Microsoft accounts when trying to dumping hashes from Elsas, whereas uh, that was not the case for the local account. Okay, so credential guard, uh, let's talk a bit about this. That seems to be sort of the standard protection against past the hash attacks. Any reasons why someone should not implement Credential Guard? Windows Defender Credential Guard poses compatibility issues. In my paper, among other things, I also tested uh, the internal monologue tool, which is an ingenious way of uh, obtaining hashes from a machine. Pretty much it works by downgrading the authentication protocol to NTLM v1, and then it forces the machine to generate hashes in that format. So with respect to Windows Credential Guard, when when this functionality is enabled, the tool is not able to do the job. And this is because any functionality related to NTLM v1 will not work when uh, the Credential Guard uh, is enabled. So if you need uh, on uh, if you need uh, to use NTLM v1, credential guard will make your life more difficult. Another area is unconstrained delegation. Also, when credential guard is on, this will not be feasible. Uh, Windows credential guard is not compatible with uh, death encryption in Kerberos either. And there are also other things that. Uh, that may cause compatibility issues. So certainly introducing this in the organization requires uh, proper testing. Yeah, so definitely test, I guess, you know, to make sure that you're not running into these, any, into these issues. So what's next for you? I assume you're almost done with your certificate? Yes, I'm almost completing my program, uh, my studies. Uh, Actually, now I'm focusing on networks, which I expect will be lots of fun. So this is what what, uh, I will be spent the next weeks on. And then with respect to this paper, when I was working on it, I got interested in uh, the relay attacks. 
in my paper, I tested SMB relay attacks, uh, and I would like to dig a, a little bit deeper, uh, trying to test uh, setting up uh, SOX proxies and making these attacks more persistent. So this is what I would like to spend some time on. Well, that sounds interesting. So thanks again for your time here. Thanks, everybody, for listening. And talk to everybody again on Monday. Thanks.